Welcome everyone to the IHS. I am Kinjal. I am associated with the Academics and Research Team here at the IHS. So the sector of handicraft is replete with punch tools. About three years ago, we were at 36,000 crores of exports. This is the third largest exports we have from this country. Not only that, but we have 744 craft cl clusters. That's more than one per district. And of course, there are 200 million artisans, 200 million plus artisans now uh, that are employed by the sector. It is second to perhaps agriculture in terms of employment. When we talk of the sector of handicraft, not just the practice, we are talking really big numbers. And yet, the average salaries in the sector remain wanting. Uh, the rate at which it can grow has been lesser than what it can. Uh, its potential for change hasn't been tapped enough. Uh, what we, therefore, it is very interesting that today we introduce this organization called 200 Million Artisans that envisions itself as an ecosystem actor that focuses on impact. Uh, their focus is on de creating dignified employment and being gender and climate sensitive while doing so, but bringing about a massive and inclusive change and growth of the handicraft sector. Uh, today, I'll introduce both my speakers here. We have Nima. She's a market sociologist, but also heads research at 200 million. And you will see in the presentation why she calls herself a segmentation specialist. It is one of the most fascinating segmentation of different enterprises that I have seen within this sector. Uh, we also have Priya. Among many other things, Priya is the CEO of 200 million. And uh, in uh, their Introductions are much longer. I'm giving an abridged version only so that we can get to the more interesting findings and have a longer time to discuss that. After their presentation, there'll be a Q&A. Um, so yeah, over to you, Priya. Thank you. So presentations make me really, really, really nervous, especially monologues. Uh, you know, it's easier when people ask me questions because then you can answer. Uh, but uh, thank you for having me uh, here, IHS, and uh, the team at IHS. Uh, Kinjal has been uh, one of our early supporters uh, at 200 Million Artisans and has guided our research pathways in more ways than one. Uh, very briefly, <clears throat> 200 Million Artisans, we, uh, for some of you who are, are in the audience, you already know that we are, we started out as a COVID response platform. We didn't set out to build an organization, honestly. It was just like many of us who wanted to support uh, different communities during COVID. Uh, 200 million artisans came out uh, as uh, a way to bridge information gaps for the sector because you know if we if we go back to covid you know there was so much noise around uh, oxygen cylinders for delhi you know like everybody was talking about oxygen cylinders in big cities and very few people were talking about the challenges that communities and rural communities were facing and uh, the reason why 200 million artisans, the name and the number itself came up, because I, being a creativity and research research nerd when it comes to creativity and creative economy, uh, I had just written an article around that time that talked about how there are 7 million artisans, officially, according to government's figures, um, and unofficially, there are 200 million livelihoods linked to the sector, and the number came from a 2013 Dasra report. And also thereafter, there were people like Rana Gupta of Yes Bank and a few others who talked about how there are 200 million livelihoods linked to the sector. And the question that came to my mind, because I was studying creative ecosystems and entrepreneurial ecosystems, I was like, in a 1.4 billion economy, if you're talking about 200 million people who follow and work with craft, that to me seems like a policy number that is a policy problem, that is an investment problem. We can't just now talk about craft from a love and fresh air perspective. This is a much bigger story here, which we are not looking into. And it became evident uh, in the, I should, yeah, forgive me, uh, sometimes I forget. So this is, before I come to what we do now, um, 
at that point, it became, um, when we started talking to funders, and really 200 million artisans at that point were people like you and me, who just came together to volunteer, and people not necessarily from craft, it were people from outside of craft, you know, uh, who said, uh, we'd like to do something for the sector, and we would, the organization, even as it stands today, has been built by the kindness of strangers and continues to be built by the kindness of strangers. Uh, it is deeply and uh, in more ways than one volunteer led. Um, and in this process, that time when we were reaching out to funders and investors and ecosystem actors saying, why don't, you know, please support the sector because there are women involved, there is climate happening, climate positive, you know, inclusion happening. Uh, there are so many jobs that are being created at the grassroots. Uh, why do you not want to support the sector? And they would turn around and say, oh, but you claim there is all these numbers and all this impact is happening, but where is the data? And the truth is that even if their data exists, uh, it hasn't been aggregated or we don't know where to find it. And I'm sure there is data and we were able to sort of go out and look for at least some of these numbers, but that was really where the challenge is. And without data, you can't have policy. You can't have investment because at the end of the day, any pitch deck, and for those of you who speak the language of business, everybody will ask for what's the market opportunity. When we can't deliver a market opportunity for a sector as big as this, then we have a problem at hand. Uh, and despite the numbers that Kinjal shared, you know, exports being X and so on and so forth, um, and we, in these last three years, have transitioned in more ways than one to what we call, like Kinjal said, an ecosystem enabler uh, with a primary focus on supporting craft-led enterprises. And when we say craft-led enterprises, we mean formal enterprises, people who are registered enterprises. We do not mean artisan, you know, informal enterprises that could be run by a single person and so on and so forth. And the reason for doing that is during the second wave of COVID, uh, you know, so many enterprises reached out to us saying, you know, Priya, we don't have a runway. We can't pay our artisans after three months. Can you help us? And it wasn't just one or two enterprises. These were all kinds of enterprises. And that's when we realized that if an enterprise crashes in this sector, it takes with them anywhere from 10 artisans to 5,000 artisans. And those artisans then become Swiggy drivers, Uber drivers, or run a mobile shop somewhere. And that is the bigger challenge. So when we talk about 200 million artisans and our transition, we call ourselves an ecosystem enabler. Think of it as a sector development organization. Uh, we are trying to bridge gaps in knowledge, which is data, information, in networks because there are so many different stakeholders that work with the craft sector, including students, academia, policymakers, investors, um, you know, stud uh, I mean, other artisans, enterprises, there are so many people who are connected, but we're all operating in our own little silos and we don't know whom to talk to, how to grow as an enterprise or even as a craft person, as a creative person. And that challenge, unless we sort of bridge some of these gaps, uh, we can't move past this. And the last piece that we are, uh, we bridge gap in, uh, the gaps in is capital. Because to move forward, you need money. Anything requires money. And I'm not saying Shark Tank investment, but we do need to get money uh, to be able to realize and visualize some of those ideas that we all have uh, that we want to sort of realize. Um, so that's basically what 200 Million Artisans does. Um, so briefly, um, <clears throat> I'm going to set the context before we get into the research itself. When we talk about the sector, and I'm going to request you guys to sort of zoom out a bit, think of it as a sector. What is a sector? Now, if you look at any other sector, you talk about education, you talk about healthcare, you talk about finance, and so on and so forth. A sector is basically coming together of many, 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 many stakeholders. It is not just artisans. In this case, it is not just the artisans. It is the academia, talking to the policymakers, talking to the investors, to the artisans, to the enterprises, to markets, to all the different people who make 
a sector. That is what a sector, a sector has a boundary. A sector has many, many stakeholders working together. Now, a sector, uh, in India, when we are talking about any sector, typically our understanding of what jobs should be, what life should look like, is all, and all the frameworks that we learn in business schools, all those frameworks are drawn from uh, jobs that are coming from formal sectors. So when we are talking about the IT industry to a large extent, these are buildings where people go to work, you have a salary, you have insurance, you have social protections potentially, uh, all of those little, little pieces. But 95%, over 90% of our entire economy operates in the informal sector, which means a swiggy driver, gig, gig workers are also part of the informal sector because basically a gig worker is not likely to get that salary slip or you know that insurance and this and that and all of those things that my mother had as part of State Bank of India. You know, none of us today have that. But more so in the informal economy, when you start talking about gig workers, uh, they definitely don't have that. And the craft sector operates squarely within the informal sector. The reason why we don't have data also is because chances are that the person who is crafting during the day is, you know, or in the evening is also working on his or her farm during the day. Now, do you identify as a farmer or do you identify as an artisan? How do you then, from a data perspective, segment yourself? These are questions that also impede data collection in some form or the other. The second piece is, and which is why there is a 200 million, is it 7 million, is it 25 million, is it 200 million? That question remains. We don't know. Because for the first time, artisans were mapped in the history of India was in 2012, during the uh, last census. So which is why the number is perhaps not all pervasive and does not account for everything. Um, and a lot of the people who work in the sector happen to be women. These are women uh, who often play, uh, carry out allied roles, you know, so while the weaver, the main weaver might be a man whom you are interacting with, but chances are that his entire family and entire household is operating and working to create that one sari or that one bartan. We are not taking them into account when we map which is also deeply problematic. And traditionally, women become the invis invisible workforce. We are naturally not counted in most of these cases. However, when the last uh, times artisans were mapped, government data alone shows that 56.13% of the artisans mapped were women. This is the largest at least in my mind, please correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not, I don't follow other sectors, but uh, the current data of work, female workforce, workforce participation perhaps went up to 37% recently until a couple of years ago when we actually put out the research, it was under 20%. This is official data that says that 56.13% of you know, a landscape is driven by women. I don't know, you know where we can see this level of gender inclusion anywhere uh, in our country, which is also why the sector becomes important. So just to also uh, talk about why enterprises, just to go back to why we talked about enterprises. Now, yes, despite with, with a name like 200 million artisans, yes, you would expect us to actually have access to 200 million artisans, or perhaps have access to a lot of artisan clusters. Uh, but one of the big realizations for us uh, in the last three years was that there are enough good people working with artisans. There aren't enough people working to support those enterprises who are then working with artisans. We don't have an entrepreneurial ecosystem and a supportive entrepreneurial ecosystem for the enterprises, especially most of them happen to be micro enterprises and MSMEs. Uh, we don't have an entrepreneurial system for these folks. Um, and this is just, you know, in the last few years, the MSMEs have exploded in the sector. And I don't know how many of you are like 
Instagram followers or, you know, um, you passive scroll. Because if you passive scroll, you would see that there are so many, 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 many brands that have emerged just in the last three years post-COVID. And we are all buying directly from those brands. You know, we are not going to big shops. We are not going to, uh, you know, big malls sometimes. We're just buying off these smaller brands that are telling great stories. And the, you know, the craft sector or the artisan economy is no different. There has been a boom of brands, of small enterprises, often led by women, that are driving the sector today. Um, and this is just some of the data. I'm not going to go into it. But overall, this is not specific to India. Globally, there has been a sort of boom as far as, uh, you know, uh, in wa people wanting to support local. You know, the vocal for local and all of that is a real thing where people are buying um, from uh, supporting many more enterprises who are producing consciously and so on and so forth. And everybody looks at those, uh, you know, uh, is it organic? Is it this? Is it that? I mean, yes, we might not be able to afford it, but we do care whether those labels are there in a lot of our brands. Uh, and that is really what is driving, uh, you know, the boom of enterprises even in the sector. <clears throat> So why particularly now from a sector development perspective? Um, because unlike before, one, one piece of the story is the enterprises themselves, the people who are producing it. You know, it could be a small brand, it could be a fashion brand that is working with, with maybe 10 artisans, but, you know, has a market cap which is significantly higher. But it could also be, uh, you know, a grassroots level brand that is, or an organization that is maybe supporting anywhere from 500 to 5,000 artisans, upskilling them, so on and so forth, and all of that. What is happening in the last five years is that all these big brands, which is IKEA, Pottery Barn, Patagonia, uh, Amazon, Walmart, all the big retail chains have come to India. Target has come to India, Uniqlo has come to India, all these folks have come to India. And if we have to, and there is global discourse also around you know, 2030, the big milestone, we have to become carbon neutral, we have to become more inclusive in our supply chains, we have to become, you know, we have to stop like being extractive. Uh, we have to enable more communities to thrive. All this is real and it's also driven by consumers like this. This na narrative is not just coming from Havimi. It is coming from consumers like you and me. Therefore, what a lot of them are doing is coming to uh, a lot of global South countries or global majority countries, uh, uh, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, India, where there is the production capacity. You need to understand that there is, you know, what is the advantage that India has today? It has raw materials. We have immense access to raw materials. We have immense access to labor, skilled labor. And we have uh, also immense access to, what is the third thing? I forgot. Uh, but the point is that we have all of this happening within India, so you don't have to go anywhere. And plus, our domestic consumption is also growing significantly, where people like us who are sort of, you know, uh, growing up the ladder, we are now consuming. And we are buying expensive stuff, and we are now, we want our homes decorated with IKEA and Patagonia and so on and so forth. Patagonia recently came and created a khadi collection. It's an outdoor brand, but it created a khadi collection in Gujarat, working with 170 artisans. Why are they doing it? So the bigger question to ask is because there is the potential for them to actually uh, build a massive, inclusive, and green supply chain out of India, which is where the craft sector is also positioned. It is positioned to be able to leverage this opportunity. But the challenge now is that supply, or rather the demand for handmade and locally produced and conscious and this and that, is, has exceeded the supply. We don't have enough supply to be able to produce in all these numbers. The reason why the supply doesn't exist is because the entrepreneurial ecosystem is not mature enough. Because we still remain small enterprises. We are still struggling. We are women-led small enterprises. We are still struggling to talk the language of finance, to talk the language of business. We don't know how to grow our enterprise, me including, by the way. Uh, but, uh, and we don't have the right kind of frameworks, the resources, and the right kind of capital to, that understands the challenges of building 
a sort of a craft-led enterprise that is traditionally seen as unscalable, as very grassrooty, not tech savvy, and there are a lot of perceptions that this sector unfortunately lives with. Uh, so therefore, the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem hasn't been built for you know enterprises that are coming in this sector. So that's where the challenge comes. So supply is not keeping up with the demand is one of the uh, big challenges, and which is where we started looking into the stories of enterprises. Um, the first research, and honestly, research happened by accident for us. We weren't planning to do research. We just kept going to different people and saying, Bahi paise de do sector ke liye. And uh, you know, everybody would say, data ka hai. And we then turned around and said, Achha, hai. we don't know. And uh, there were a good bunch of folks who came together uh, during um, a, a small research project that was commissioned to us by the British Council and Creative PC from uh, UK. And all they told us was, hey, why don't you study informality uh, in your country? Uh, so we proposed, why don't we study informality, but through the perspective of the cultural economy. Now, um, when we started looking at the culture, and that was the first time I heard the word cultural economy, because I'm used to hearing the word creative and cultural industries. I've, I'm used to hearing the word creative economy. Uh, and creative economy is a you know, there's an entire discourse around it. It just doesn't mean that, oh, but every enterprise is creative, every person, every entrepreneur is creative. No, sorry. There is an entire discourse around creative economy, so I will not go into that. But when we looked at, uh, you know, enterprises operating uh, and navigating informality within the cultural economy, those were the three things that we looked at. So first was enterprise, second was informality, and the third was cultural economy. So this particular research, uh, we didn't have too much time and not too much, too many resources, but what we did was to look at uh, craft-led enterprises across the MSME spectrum. Now, MSME spectrum is something that starts often at the nano level, which most people don't talk about, but it's the micro, small, medium enterprises, and we chose to follow the government definition of it. You know, turnover has to be X, turnover has to be Y, so on and so forth, all of that. And we chose 12 enterprises across the spectrum of this size and the turnover cap. So the largest enterprise we mapped was Jaipur Rugs. Then came Industry Foundation based out of Bangalore. Uh, we also looked at Ranga Sutra, uh, and we, it also had to have geographic repre representation. So we looked at five, 12 different enterprises. Some of them were medium-sized, some of them were aggregators, some of them were working in Assam, somebody was working in uh, Gujarat. We also looked at artisan entrepreneurs. So while there were at one level these massive big enterprises supporting 40,000 artisans, and then there was this artisan entrepreneur supporting like five artisans. Uh, but we looked at their business models, we looked at how they were navigating business and how, more importantly, they were navigating informality. And when we say informality, to give you an example, a lot of these business models, which is what is honestly, and I will urge you guys, because this is really like the, the aha moment for us in this research, where we looked at these business models and was, they said none of these business models are expecting their artisans to actually come to a factory. None of these business models are built around factories. There is no factory. That is what was the most interesting piece of the research because when we started looking at them, they all were like, we do not want to displace our artisans. Artisans are more productive when they work in the communities where they have to live. A lot of them, because they are women, they have to also take care of the child. They also have to take care of the mother-in-law. They also have to take care of the husband. And they also want community and kinship and all of that with, you know, friends in their neighborhood. When, I mean, we're looking at some of these biggest, you know, like a 25 million, you know, revenue generating organization, which is telling us that factory is not It is all dispersed. For us, that was really the aha moment, and we realized that there is a whole different business engagement and a way of looking at business that we have. This is uh, an entire discourse around business that is unique to India, and we haven't even taken it seriously. As a business model, as a business approach, we 
keep looking at Harvard Business Reviews and you know Stanford Social Innovation Review, and I also do that. Uh, I'm very colonized like that. Uh, but the point being that uh, you know we are not looking at grassroots business models in our own country that are creating value on ground, not just for the consumer, but for the communities on ground. For me, I think, and I will only speak from a personal perspective, this was like seriously one of the best moments of discovery when the pattern started emerging and I said, oh my God, there are, this is just 12, but I think there are more that are doing this. And their reasoning is simple that you know, we need to take the work where the communities are. So they were navigating informality. In fact, the informality was not a bad thing. We call it a bad thing in the country. It is not a bad thing. It is, in fact, spurned and spurred all kinds of new business models that are actually more inclusive, that are talking about taking the work to the communities uh, and, you know, making sure that communities thrive where they are. That is the first sort of aha moment for us. Um, and there are, if you go to the businessofhandmade.com, there are case studies where, you know, even artisans have spoken. Uh, and they talk about how that, you know, the work coming to them actually led to economic mobility. They, it led to a lot of gender inclusion. They got their first bank accounts. In case of Ranga, uh, Ranga Sutra, which is a, a sort of organization that works up north, the women, it's also from a business model perspective, now we are talking about in the US alternative ownership enterprises and so on and so forth. This was an alternative ownership enterprise where the artisans were shareholders in a company. They had voting rights in a company. Now that to me is exciting and this is here, it's happening in India. It is not part of any case study in our business schools, which is strange to me. Um, so that is really what the first business of handmade looked at and the fact that it was driving both livelihoods, inclusive livelihoods, it was driving uh, gender inclusion in a huge way, it was driving social protections, um, and the case stories sort of, you know, have gone into details about what are the SDGs that they're attacking and so on and so forth, and there are about 12 of them. Please take a look. Um, the other thing I would like to sort of talk about, when we talk about um, businesses, there is an assumption in our heads, you know, and let's, I mean, Shark Tank is my fav favorite attacking point right now. Uh, for no fault of theirs, I think they're doing a damn good job, but it just becomes a great reference point for me. Uh, so when we look at a business, you know, any business, if you go to business school, they will say lean startup, X, Y, Z. There are certain things that they will tell you in, as part of business discourse. And there is an assumption in all our heads that Businesses across the world are one and the same. Basically, they operate, you know, and follow one set path of scale, growth, whatever. Everybody eventually has to become an Airbnb or a Facebook, and, you know, we all have to become unicorns. And unicorns are celebrated. And there is also an assumption that every person who becomes an entrepreneur is uh, looking or, you know, they have very set motivations for why they become an entrepreneur in our heads. Uh, because other examples of success stories that we consume are uh, often of certain kinds of entrepreneurs, right? So um, this plug and play concept, okay, this method will work for our business, is something now, you know, we all assume is what's going to happen. We'd like to sort of debunk that at some level and say that when you start talking about the cultural economy, culture has its own little say when building a business model. What is culture? Let's talk about, I mean, you know, so that I don't feel like it's a monologue uh, perpetually, but let's get our understanding of what is culture. Culture <laughs> in a cultural economy Culture, any individuals or a group's unique social behavior uh, and norms carries measurable value and more often than not impacts economic activity in a cultural economy. To, and which also includes business model, our ideas of success, our ideas of what a business model should be, our ideas of what scale should be. All of that gets impacted when culture comes into conversation with business. 
um, just to give you a very sort of, you know, localized sort of understanding, and this is not again to, uh, we will call out certain communities in India as being more entrepreneurial than certain communities as not being as entrepreneurial, right? I mean, I, without naming names, but we do have that stereotyping, right? And which is again unique to India in some ways, because we have, I don't know, 10,000 mother tongues. We have a few different, you know, like 20 plus states. You go from this state to the next state, the language changes, the culture changes, how you dress changes, how you talk changes, how everything, how you engage with each other changes. What your mother tells you in this state is very different from what a mother tells somebody else in the other state, neighboring state. That is how diverse culture is in countries like India and also in the countries of the global south. I've lived in the US. Um, sorry. Yes. So I've lived in the US and just to complete that thought, there are two languages, primarily languages that you speak in. English and uh, Spanish. Now, so you will see signage in only those two languages. So when you build business models, you're building a business model in English. You're not building a business model in Gujarati or Kannada, right? That is what cultural economy means. And therefore, uh, the first business of handmade in some ways also talked about how the informal interacts with the formal and the formal nature of the businesses, like a Ranga Sutra or an industry or whatever, Aitokri, the formality uh, interacts with the informality and creates a whole new category called the new formal. That is what is exciting about the business models that are emerging in the craft sector and now they need to be further studied. Um, and the other piece, when we talk about scale in the craft sector, the one perception that everybody talks about, oh, it is not scalable. It is not tech heavy. It is not this, it is not that. Okay, great, it is analog. Uh, my dear friends, who defines what is scale and what is success? This is a country where we have control over our own discourse. And if this is working, then why not amplify this? Because there are a few thousand unicorns, there are a few hundred thousand MSMEs across the world. And if this is working for craft-led MSMEs, this is how the scale is, will, will happen, where uh, you know, there is decentralized scale. It is not in factories. You little pockets in different parts of the world, uh, in different parts of the country. You have to start looking at it, not just in little clusters, but also the sector as an integrated value chain. Where does the value chain begin? It actually begins at the agri-value chain, at the farm level. Where the farm you know, is where the inputs come from, and then goes right up to the consumer. And the value add happens in the middle. Which is why you need technology, but technology is an enabler. It is not a digital first or whatever tech first sector. It is, remains an analog sector, but with massive uh, impact potential. Can technology come in? Yes, of course. In fact, technology needs to come in because a lot of the back-end processes now need to be streamlined. You know, the handmade can remain handmade, but you can still use, use self, Salesforce and ERP systems and all of that, and you can still use Canva to put stuff on uh, Instagram. Technology is important, but it needs to now streamline the sector. And the last piece is to say, I, and I'm not saying this, and I'm speaking the language of business, the artisan needs to be a partner. The artisan needs to be seen as a peer. No, artisan cannot be seen as just a, just a laborer, just as a workforce, as an invisible workforce, because what is happening right now, and this is one of our uh, research reports that is going to launch soon, we mapped four states uh, and collective enterprises in four states. In those four states, uh, handloom collectives, the average age of the artisan today is 47 years old, a weaver. The monthly income of a weaver is less than 10,000 rupees. Please tell me if it was you in that position, would you want to work in the artisan sector? Would you want your child to become an artisan? I'm sorry, my mother wouldn't want me uh, to not go into a career which does not show prospects. It's simple logic. Therefore, the artisan now needs to have economic mobility. The next generation has to be now seen as a peer because they also engage with technology. They also talk like us. They want to have a bike. 
what is wrong with all of that? Don't we want aspirational mobility? And that is why the artisan needs to be seen as a co-creator and a partner really to make a business case if the sector has to survive. Because if we do not, if the average age of the artisan is 45, 47, then we don't have a next generation left, which means there is no supply going forward for any big ideas that we have for the sector. So that uh, is the first business of handmade. Now coming back to the second business of handmade, when we finished the first business of handmade, we realized every enterprise wanted money. And it was also interesting because every enterprise wanted different kinds of money. It wasn't just one kind of money. Of course, the assumption is because, you know, everybody, our idea of the craft sector is also non-profit led. You know, there are certain uh, folks that, you know, it has traditionally seen non-profit entities. Um, but when uh, this particular research started, when we on the backbone of the first business of Handmade applied to um, an, an international funder uh, that wanted to build evidence for catalytic capital, and I'll come to what is catalytic capital later. We were one of the 14 projects selected across the world, and uh, the supporter, uh, commissioning partner, was C3 Grant Making, which is Omidyar, Rockefeller, and MacArthur Foundations. And they wanted us to map if uh, what are the challenges, financing challenges, of craft-led MSMEs, and what are the opportunities, and if catalytic capital can play a role. That was the brief given to us. So we became very ambitious. We said, pehle to qualitative kiya with 12 stories. This time we'll go quantitative. <laughs> And uh, we are a very young organization. <laughs> we are very small. <laughs> so when we took this on, uh, Nima was one of the you know, first people I brought in, or rather, you know, the external consultant we brought in, because I was like, data I'm a qualitative person. I don't understand how to like, you know, make sense of numbers. But um, <clears throat> this particular research map, the, uh, what we, it, sorry, it, it was carried out over almost two years. Um, we had an extensive process of looking into who do we map, how do we map, should it be handmade, should it only be pure craft, X, Y, Z, all kinds of questions emerged. Uh, and eventually we ended up mapping, um, we spoke to almost 70 stakeholders, which included enterprises of varying sizes, types, so on and so forth, across the value chain, huh? not just the consumer end of it. Um, we also ended up uh, speak, speaking to funders, investors, angel investors, all kinds of ecosystem actors who were talking. And this was the first time we actually sat back to listen to everybody. And we realized that everybody was struggling with their own challenges. You know, the enterprises had their own challenges. The investors wanted to invest in the sector, didn't have information. Uh, the ecosystem actors were like, how do we support everybody? Because we don't have enough information. But everything boiled down to information and the fact that they were operating in different silos. Um, so the first, you know, um, we also ran, uh, based on the initial conversations that we had with uh, uh, the stakeholders and the qualitative interviews that we ran, um, we ended up running a, a survey called the Funding for Handmade Survey, which Nima designed. Um, and we thought we will not get, uh, we were nervous. We thought we will not get more than like 100 people. We had promised 500 win, you know, completes. Don't ask us why. Uh, but uh, eventually, after the first 100, I think we thought we will not move forward. But the survey strangely became viral. Because once the enterprises started taking the survey, they reached out to other enterprises saying, oh my god, you need to take the survey. Because nobody has asked us these questions before. You need to take the survey for your own understanding of what are the right questions to ask. So that's how we went from 100, you know, somehow to 516 in, I think, two months. And we were fairly shocked, but also it required a lot of work from our team at that point, because every member of the team that was working on the research was literally calling enterprises at that time saying, please take the survey, because it was also a long survey. It was almost 35 minutes uh, on a good day. You know, it went on to one and a half hours for a lot of people because it, they took that much time, but it was interesting. Um, these were some of the early insights that came from what, you know, uh, what they wanted the sector to be, what were the challenges, and so on and so forth. Um, this 
and the clear sort of one big takeaway that we got, and I will get into the granular takeaways later, but the one big takeaway that we got was that this sector was sitting on a massive opportunity, which is not necessarily gender or decent work or climate or all of it. The big star was actually SDG 12, which is responsible consumption and production. The subsequent stars, because gender, livelihoods, and climate are actually intersectional in the sector. They, you, don't, you can't you know, put them, piece them separately. If you create jobs, technically, you're likely to create jobs for women. If you create, you know, uh, if you work with a craft enterprise, depending on what the kind of enterprise is, a lot of them are also actually committed to sustainability, so chances are they will drive uh, climate in more ways than one. But the larger story is that it is a sector squarely anchored in responsible consumption and production because it is a retail sector. Unless you sell, nothing moves. If you do not sell, you cannot hire more artisans, train more artisans, pay more artisans. If you do not sell, your company doesn't grow. Then what do you talk about impact? You first, you know, you first take care of your own house before you try to save the others, right? If you can't grow a company, and I'm not saying it needs to become a Facebook or a Airbnb, but it needs to grow so that there are more artisans who can be employed, more can be trained, more can be brought into the workforce. So therefore, for the sector to grow, it needs to sell. And it needs to then create, talk to the consumers about how we now talk about selling. You can still talk to the consumers and say, hey, I will not get you the product like Amazon does tomorrow. Can you wait for 15 days? And that's where the innovation now needs to begin. But we need to understand that this is a sales sector, a retail sector, squarely. Um, <clears throat> Let me just move on. Uh, very quickly, I will take you through, OK. This is where uh, the other big sort of uh, insight that came is that going back to the earlier piece, there isn't a homogenous enterprise. If we are talking about the sector from the farm to the consumer, then there are different kinds of enterprises that are operating in the sector. And to, this is the first time there is enterprise segmentation that has happened in the sector. And therefore, for that, I will bring in Neema Srinivasan, who runs Berylytics uh, and who came in as a consultant to actually go through loads and loads of data and finally arrive at these segments. Uh, is everyone able to hear me okay? You're able to, all right. Um, so a segmentation for uh, uh, those coming in a little fresh in, in, into this is if you're familiar with Harry Potter, you have the Gryffindors, you have the Slytherins, and then if you see uh, India maps and things like that, now they even do the states like that. Uh, like recently I found out that uh, Tamil Nadu is a Slytherin while Maharashtra is Gryffindor. And there's like a re rationale for things like that. And that's kind of what you do, which may seem a little weird and like you just pull it out of a hat. Uh, but what we're really doing here is trying to figure, okay, so this is what defines you uh, it, at this point in time. And this is why this makes sense. Uh, and doing that exercise, it's a lot of what uh, uh, Priya was already talking about. When we know ourselves, we can be the best version of ourselves. And we can present ourselves better. And in this case, our whole thing was, OK, enterprises and funders need to be able to connect better and talk better. So this whole thing of catalytic capital and all that she will get to, the whole point is money. It's a little hard to be any bigger than that small little backyard that you were in if you don't have more money, if you can't like bet on yourself a bit. Uh, and how can we help make that happen? Uh, so in the initial 70 plus interviews that we did, we asked uh, you know, funders, we asked ecosystem enablers, and even enterprises themselves, what kinds of enterprises are there? And the thing is that you're too, when you're too close to it, it's a little hard to tell what kinds there are. Uh, so the general consensus was that it is the Rangasutra type. Uh, meaning that you know you have a couple of artisans, you're helping some tribals, you're helping, it, it is like some women sitting and weaving something. It's never more than that. Uh, that. That is all it is. And the problem with that association is, then, they th okay, a couple of women are doing something in a backyard. Uh, and they can't be taken too seriously. Uh, which means that, you know, who will fund that? That's not scalable. Everything that Priya was talking about, uh, these perceptions start holding them back. 
So we were like, okay, this will be a reality check. What really is happening? And that was the intent of the segmentation. Uh, and to do a segmentation, right, you don't start off with the assumption, okay, I'm trying to look for these kind of people. You just go around and trying to understand each one. Okay, what are your challenges? Who are you trying to be? What is your journey? Um, uh, what would you like to be? Who do you see yourself as? So you understand all of this really well. It's like Myers bringing them to death, uh, but understanding them in context. And that's kind of what we did. And if, when you do that, you find out that actu uh, there is a whole spectrum. And this is how it is. Uh, now, I do this all the time with brands and you know categories. Everything from sports, uh, uh, performance wear. It can be uh, uh, saris. It can be uh, 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 lingerie. It can be anything. It doesn't really matter. It can be food. It can be swiggy. You find out, uh, OK, what is really going on in today's market? Because the market today, in 2024, where Gen Z are a majority force of consumers that are, and are getting into the workforce. It's a very different thing from what it was even before COVID. So you always have to map a market at that point in time. And that's what we did. So you start here with input innovators. Now, broadly, what an we will get a little bit of detail after this. But what is interesting is that when you hear the word input innovator, you don't really think, OK, a woman sitting and weaving something. Uh, or a man sitting and weaving something, uh, a, a lost art. So because now suddenly it's input, it's innovation, what's really going on? You may have seen with some businesses uh, these references to, you know, from soil to store, uh, you know, that kind of thing, uh, that there is a whole chain that's happening. Uh, you saw the, uh, the reference to climate change. Now, this has become really big. And as we become more evolved consumers, more conscious consumers, we don't want something that's going to take like a ton of water uh, to grow the seed or to make a, a pair of jeans. We're like, you're going to make it out of uh, you know, crushed bottles and old shoes? Fantastic. I'll wear that. Uh, there are enough people who believe things like that. And there will be more as uh, you know, the, the planet suffers more. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I was when I was in Amsterdam, I was at uh, a museum for craft, uh, and uh, there's like obviously, you know, when it comes to historical references and weaves, you'll always find something from India, Africa, all of that was there. When I went to the more advanced sections, where you know people are creating unbelievable materials uh, with uh, with waste, with, uh, with and what can be scalable. Fool was the only organization from India that actually made an appearance there. Uh, so, but you know, they, what, because they've taken, for those who, uh, who are unfamiliar, it's flowers uh, from Varanasi. That's what they're taking. And they're uh, making that into incense. Um, they're uh, looking to uh, make other materials, like feather and things like that. So uh, this is where the market will be. So it's, it was a very small number that we found, as opposed to, obviously, we found a lot of these grassroots to market nurturers. So the description of each one will kind of tell you uh, what's really going on with them. So I'm just going to go straight into input innovators. So early in the value chain, that's who they are. Uh, create materials. Uh, and this becomes, when we have these conversations with the industry itself, with enterprises, they're very surprised. OK, we didn't know that this is also who we are sort of the, the, you know, the brother and the sisterhood kind of increases and expands. Um, so focus on growing eco-friendly yarn, fiber seeds. This is that world as well. They need funding. They need to grow. And they will make that impact, that positive impact that Priya was talking about. So you have a couple of the examples that we're talking, uh, talking about as well. Uh, and uh, far fewer today, but this will be set to grow. If you look at things like the growth rate, uh, they will be pretty impressive. And that's what that is about. So 2% based on what we got from our sample out there, there may be, there may be more. Uh, but they will be a minority, and the growth rate will be uh, really high. I'm sorry. OK. So the grassroots uh, to market nurturers, this is the typical stereotype. Uh, obviously, we get, and you can see that 26%. It's not like 90% is these people. Uh, it is a significant proportion. And we'll find out also why that is so. Uh, so these are, uh, so you can see Rang Sutra is one, um, and then uh, Seva is one. These are all like familiar names that you would have seen. Uh, definitely, you know, women uh, dominated uh, in terms of the kind of people who gravitate to these kinds of businesses and also the kind of uh, artisans who tend to participate in it. So it is the marginalized populations. And while that might cater to the stereotype, uh, 
the, pr the point is that this is very, very critical. Being Indians and knowing what we know about the Indian landscape, we can't be like, okay, that's not cool. That's not really where the VCs will go. This is also critical. And in fact, uh, you would have seen a quote from Rahul Noble Singh, uh, Rang Sutra. Uh, the good thing is that as men come into these industries, um, it, it, it makes it seem more formal. So, uh, and therefore people are like, okay, so this is a CFO and that's a COO and you're running like a business and therefore I understand it. And therefore these things get kind of upgraded to that section. Um, and uh, in, the example I think of is Google. Uh, I was asking about the impact of maternity leave uh, and when employees go away. And I was told actually there isn't a negative perception around women leaving because so many men leave, because men take as much leave as the women. Uh, and it's, it becomes equal like that. And that's kind of like a parallel that happens here, uh, where when you have men come into it, it doesn't seem like this sort of, okay, this side business at the back, which will never be bigger, and that sort of thing. So, uh, uh, and for these guys also, we started picking up on a trend where, while previously they would just do stuff in the back end, and then say, okay, somebody else go and we'll supply to an Ikea, we'll supply to somebody else. But slowly they started building their own brands, and that was a trend that we noticed. And we'll talk about why that is so. The third segment uh, we call process enhancers. Uh, and these guys are, are the first ones where we saw, saw actual tech. Uh, now, uh, a lot of you would be hearing a lot about AI. Now, that's the uh, you know, most thrown about buzzword at the moment. People are still figuring out what it is about. But what you will find is that when you talk to VCs and all of that, if you say art, in fact, we've actually had people tell us that. The moment you say it's a woman uh, designer doing this or it's an artisan something else, we know it's not scalable and then we are not interested. That's kind of, that is the stereotype. But the, when you start saying things like, okay, you know what, you want transparency. You want to know what the origin is. You want to know what the source is. Then this, uh, uh, this technology enables that. We will know who really made it. If you want to geotag something, you can do it this way. So being able to facilitate things like that, again, this is something that will grow with time. Uh, it can also be something where uh, uh, it, it may not just be AI and things like that, where something that otherwise felt like donkey work, which was literally a reference used, where a husband makes mocks his wife uh, and calls her a donkey because of the way she has to sit when she uses the equipment for weaving. Uh, but this, uh, uh, you know, just a little bit of tinkering around makes some sort of equipment uh, that's te that technically enhances it, it makes things more uh, efficient, uh, and therefore, of course, we got only 1% in our sample uh, of this, but uh, so Kosha is one, if you see, they're lesser known because most of these guys work in the back end, uh, but uh, uh, they do really interesting work. And the idea is to uh, enable supply chain transparency and improve the quality of the artisans' lives. Uh, another thing is because it's technology, it's often scalable, and therefore it tends, and it also tends to be men-led, and therefore it has a different uh, the conversation takes a different tenor when they when they approach VCs. Uh, then the fourth one is I mean online aggregator may sound a little foreign, uh, but essentially if you're if you've heard of uh, Go Coop or uh, Lal Ten, you know these kinds of guys, it is it is again a scalable model because what they're doing is they provide a platform and many of these guys can come there and sell. Uh, and post-COVID, again, as people figured, okay, I'm going to have to be really savvy about this, that started working really well. Uh, we had 4% of our sample. And you can see, like, it's like really tiny, tiny, tiny things, but it's still different. Uh, so tech marketplace aggregator, all of these guys come together, and then they build, they are able to build scale. So actually, one of the differentiating aspects is can you build scale or can you not build scale? Now, if you can't build scale, we can figure other strategies for you. But what was important also was for funders and VCs to understand that this is not anti-scale. That is also possible, and this is evolving in ways most people don't really realize. This, of course, was one of the most interesting, now I guess uh, we'd be hard pressed to find people who haven't really bought from what we called a DigiNative upstart. And it's DigiNative, you can see at 45%, they were one of the biggest segments uh, if you are on Facebook or Instagram, these guys have cracked those algorithms typically. Uh, they're guys who've been able to come from nowhere. That's why they're an upstart. Uh, like previously, it would not be possible because you'd have these legacy players, brick and mortar players, and then they would just 
rule the roost, right? And uh, But these guys are typically, and if you look at the codes, it'll be very modern, very contemporary, very millennial Gen Z. Uh, the language, the way they talk, uh, uh, the values they hold, also the finesse they're able to bring to the table. They may be, you know, like founders with very little budgets, but when you look at sort of the brand ethos of what they're able to convey, uh, it'll be very, very pulled together. They know who they are. They know who they are not. Um, and so it's a, a really, really fascinating space. Obviously, we've, uh, one of the reasons probably also is these guys are very aware. Uh, they were easier to engage with. They knew this was happening, that virality and all that also has an, uh, a, a function of it being 45% of the sample. Um, so they're priced to be affordable. You know, your take your 10% off. Uh, they know every event, they, uh, and they will do promotions during that time. They really understand that world uh, almost naturally, and that's who they are. And then finally, at the top end of the game, uh, we call these lifestyle curators. Now, lifestyle curators, you can see some of the examples like Good Earth. Uh, I imagine a lot of people are very familiar with Ogan. Some level of familiarity uh, could be there. Uh, but the, the point with these guys are they're sort of like more upper end, they, they understand uh, very often they will have a retail space. It's not just online only. You saw that the previous one was called Digi Native. While this is like a world that you can go, you immerse yourself into those values. It'll slightly feel, it, it'll literally be if you are middle class uh, or lower, you walk in, it'll make no sense. It'll be like, why is this sack like kurta? 12,000 rupees. Uh, but the thing is that it actually, there's a lot of values and feeling and ethos Im imbued into it that you're supposed to pick up on. And there is a market for that. Um, so that's essentially what it is. And so there is, it is about cultural capital. And this is another space where uh, the market will grow as Indians say, okay, I am not middle class. I am not rich loud. Then what am I? So for that market, this will grow, and that's what it will be. And with that, I'll uh, hand right over back to Priya. A lot of time for verbal diarrhea. <laughs> uh, but OK, so now that we have a, some sense of understanding of who these enterprises are. I didn't want to come into the financing, you know, numbers around financing without giving you folks a sense of what we mean when we talk about enterprises. So interestingly, we mapped 516 enterprises. Uh, top level data, um, first of all, these are young, hungry enterprises. Uh, a significant percentage of these enterprises were actually set up in the last 10 years. These are not legacy enterprises. These are not your, you know, um, for lack of a better word, these are not old school enterprises. These are young enterprises. One is that. Secondly, uh, our, our data alone shows, I have to be careful about what I say sometimes, but uh, even our data is showing that 50% um, of these enterprises are led by women. So there is the government data that we referenced earlier, which is about artisans. Now, our data is saying that 50% of these enterprises are women-led. 70% of these enterprises are supporting a 50% plus workforce of women workforce, which means the gender inclusion that these enterprises are driving, despite whatever their category might be, is significantly high. 95% of these enterprises have women in their C-suite, 95%. Greatest, you know, from a data, women's inclusion data perspective, this is gold. Now, of all these enterprises, 88% are self-financing their operations, which means they're not. When we say, I'm going to differentiate between three words here. There is funding, there is financing, and there's investment, okay? Funding is what, say, a philanthropic organization gives you a grant. They have no expectations from you, except that you put it to good use for to drive impact or to create something on ground. Yeah, you don't have to return that money. Financing is typically you take a loan from a bank. Yeah, to do something and you return it back. Typically, finance is linked to some sort of debt solution. There is an interest rate and so on and so forth. And investment is what you see on Shark Tank. 
where there will be, you will pitch, you will dilute. So if you are the sole owner of 100% of your company, you will dilute, say 10%, 12%, 30%, 50%, depending on how much money you want and give it to somebody else and give that stake to somebody else in exchange for money. So these are three kinds of one words you need to, it took us a while as well, so these are three words we need to understand. When we say 88% are self-financing their operations or self-funding also, which means they're not part of any of the ecosystem of money. We are not taking money from anybody, we are not giving money to anybody, we are, we, are, we are just not interacting with money. We are taking money from our friends and family. Or we are, if we make products, the profits we are putting back into our company. That is the only, correct me if I'm wrong, as an entrepreneur, Anyways, but that is typically how a craft enterprise operates, which means you are not even part of a massive financing ecosystem in our country. So that is the first thing. 65% of these enterprises find it difficult to access finance. Uh, and most, most enterprises don't even know how to talk to investors, how to talk to funders, you know, what is the, you know, PNL statement kya hota hai, what are the documents you need to keep ready to even go and ask for money. Now financing, the other interesting nuance that comes in is that, let's go to the next data point. 45% avoid banks. Can somebody tell me why? Trick question. <laughs> you avoid banks, yeah. right? I mean, yes, the perception around the fact that getting a loan from a bank is very difficult is most certainly aiding this challenge, but I'll tell you why. We'll go back to the data around women. 50% of the women or the enterprises are women-led. What do banks ask when they have to give you a loan? They ask for collateral. How many women in this room own an asset that they can put against for collateral to take, a, take money from the bank? I don't. I'm an entrepreneur. I don't. And if we are talking about then, that becomes the first challenge. Then who are the people running these businesses? Chances are that most of these people who have founded these businesses are either coming from a design school, a fashion school, some sort of creative skill training is your first entry point. Now in any creative skills training, if you're first, if you've graduated or done your masters in some sort of a creative skill, chances are that curriculum would not have included uh, any uh, focus on business or finance. Am I correct here? Because I went to journalism school, they didn't tell me how to even figure out my own finances. I was told I need to become a journalist. Simple. Any designer, and most of these enterprises are set up by designers, by people who come straight out of NIFT, or from design schools, or from creative schools. It's another matter, like Nima pointed out, that there are, there's an influx of a new kind of founder and you know, expertise that is coming in, but that is the second problem, which means you don't know how to talk money. So that is also one of the biggest reasons, and women are generally a little careful about taking debt. Right? We are careful about taking debt. We do not want liability. Therefore, we will not go to the bank. And we don't like our paperwork. You know, a lot of us, because the, it is long drawn paperwork, it becomes difficult. What do you need money for? Now, when you're running an enterprise, there are four kinds of capital that you require. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but first, first set of capital is that you need money to set up the business. It's the seed capital. You know, you usually turn to friends and family for that. The second kind of capital that you need is to grow the business, which is working capital. Right? Just to keep the operations running, which is often where the banks and the loans and things like that come in. The third kind of capital is innovation capital. You want to test out something new. You know, and you need somebody to give you like high risk capital where even if you don't return the money, it's okay. But they are having, they basically putting faith in your vision to create a new test. Right? Somebody put money on Airbnb. Now that's why it's Airbnb today. And the last kind of capital is growth capital. You've reached a certain stage, you are sitting at 300 artisans, you want to zoom, everything is set up in your business. You know, the operations are set up, the processes are set up, you know exactly how you need to grow. 
and you are confident that you can grow from 300 artisans to 3,000 artisans and grow quickly. You need growth capital. Now, innovation capital and growth capital requires equity. Working capital requires finance, which is debt, primarily debt. Seed capital could be loans, grants, so on and so forth. So at every stage of your business, you require different kinds of capital. And most enterprises struggle, struggle to keep, sustain their enterprises because they are not linked to our financing ecosystem. They're not linked to banks. They're not linked to any NBFCs, which means they don't even know where to go if they want to grow their business and to keep it running on most days. So that's where the biggest challenge is. So la the second piece is uh, most enterprises are also not um, registered as part of Startup India. There is enough money that the government has. However, you will only know if you have access to schemes if you're registered with the MSME, you know, if you have the Udyam, Udyam registration. Most people don't even know that they can access money through the government, through the government schemes. And they struggle with complex GST, you know, registrations and structures and so on and so forth. So that becomes from a policy aspect that they, you know, everywhere they are knackered. This is broadly the five things that an enterprise faces when it comes to accessing capital in this ecosystem. The first one is collateral, like we talked about. The second one is return expectations. The craft enterprise generally grows slowly, and this is also at a nascent stage, as we know that the sector has started coming up with enterprises only in the last 10 years. So unless then the return expectations at this early stage can't be two to three years of taking money and giving returning money. We need at least a five to 10 year window to return money if you're taking capital, which doesn't exist right now. The access, most enterprises don't even know where to look for money. Is it the bank? Is it the NBFC? Is it an investor? Do we go to Shark Tank? We don't know where to find these answers. We don't know. Financing instruments. Right now, there are only two kinds of financing instruments. One is equity. The other one is debt, which is a loan. But actually, there are many, many more you know, options available which most people are not aware of. And the last, sizes, last piece is ticket sizes. A ticket size is basically how much money do you need. And our enterprises right now, depending on the size and scale of your enterprise, could want 5 lakhs and up to 5 crores, depending on the size and scale. But that is the largest chunk where the money is required, which means because they are micro enterprises, that is where the bulk of financing is required, which is not available to them as of today. This is broadly, if you can see what they want money for, it's mainly to run a retail sector and a retail-led enterprise, which is also that level of financing and retail-centered support is not available to these enterprises. If you tell an enterprise that is focusing on selling and you ask them to make a theory of change, or if you ask them to use Scrum, how does it matter what the enterprise needs is access to global networks and marketplaces? No? What is the point of doing Scrum? Unless it is a big enough enterprise and it is useful. So what support to give a craft-led enterprise, a lot of ecosystem actors also do not know. So when you go to an incubator or an accelerator, chances are they will not know how to help you. That is the other problem. Like I said, the biggest kind, so of all this, literally one in 10 MSME right now has access to finance, which means imagine if they had access to finance, this sector would be booming in some other direction altogether. And mostly it's sitting between the nano and the small. Once you hit the medium, you've already figured out how to move forward. It's here where the sector is struggling. And the solution for that, we are saying, is catalytic capital. Just to give you a very small example of what is catalytic capital, just to break it down, everybody knows impact investors, commercial investors, right? You know, these are people, your VCs and so on and so forth. We, I mean, VCs who want impact are impact investors. Technically, impact investors are supposed to give you more concessions. However, typically, they also expect market rate returns. These are people who take equity. Then comes the philanthropic actors, which are people who will give you grants. That is how the sector has operated for all this time. What we are saying is catalytic capital is somewhere in the middle. 
What catalytic capital does, and we, are, we have examples of that on our website. There are at least many case studies that have been used. One example of that could be revenue-based financing. What does that mean? Where, depending on your revenue, we will take a percentage of it as an investor. We'll give you money, but every time you make more revenue, we'll take a percentage of it. That seems equitable, right? You know, that's fair. Same, if you need working capital, basically what you need is purchase order financing or PO-based financing or invoice factoring. Basically, if you get an invoice, somebody makes an order and gives you commitment, I'm taking this, you know, I'm commissioning this order. You have that invoice, right? You can use that invoice to now take money from somebody else saying, Ki, listen, I have been promised this order. Now give me money so that I can run my operations. Now that is a kind of financing. And there are many such approaches where the investor, a catalytic capital investor will say, Ki, listen, because the sector needs to grow. I am taking a higher risk so that, you know, they, the enterprise is able to survive for three years and has those records. Because finally, even to seek equity or any other bigger kind of investment, you need some sort of record saying Ki, we were successful for three years, right? It's like a fellowship. Somebody will, you know, or you know, how you get into a school, they'll say, what are your credentials? It's those credentials, basically a catalytic capital investor helps an enterprise build credentials over three years by taking a much higher risk and saying, instead of, you know, taking a 10% or say 24% interest, I will take 15% interest from you. It's still, it's interest, but I will take a higher risk. Now what that does, it opens up the market for other players to come in because the enterprise then is able to grow over a period of time. And once it shows growth, the commercial investors and impact investors can come in. So therefore, what we are saying the sector needs is catalytic capital. So that people who are willing to take a higher risk on the sector and the enterprises and meet the enterprises where they are. Now, why is this important? These enterprises, if any startup in the NBFC world, in healthcare, in education, has to work with the craft sector, trust me, it's not easy. The craft-led enterprises are the ones building trust-led bridges with the artisan communities, the informal communities. I'll go back to informality. Now, they are the ones formalizing the communities in some form or the other. And they are getting them used to Google Pay, they are getting them used to whatever. They are the entry point for other startups to come in. But without supporting the craft-led enterprises, other startups cannot come in. And there are, we have enough examples within 200M where other startups, financial startups, and NBFCs have tried to come in. They can't because to build faith and trust with the artisan communities is a very, very long job. It takes a lot of time. Then these are broadly, the, this is also where the enterprises are stuck because there's no sector level portfolio right now. You have to have investment portfolios designed for the sector, we don't have that. We need patient investors, we need sector level portfolios. We also need relevant networks to that understand this is a retail led sector. And more importantly, all the founders need financial literacy. We need to be able to ask the right questions. We don't have that. And from an investor perspective, it's also not their fault because they also don't know which are the enterprises that are available, whom should they invest in and what terms of engagement should happen. There is no information and data for size, all of that. And what are the success stories? You know, if we invest X today, in three years, what does it become? We don't have those success stories because they haven't been told. And we also need sector-specific intermediaries which know what the challenges of the sector are. You can't go to a tech intermediary and say, help me understand craft. Won't work. And of course, policy level incentives, both folks actually need policy level incentives to operate uh, strongly in the sector. I will leave you just with one last thought, sort of tying up everything that uh, we've so far covered. Uh, this is just high level data uh, when it comes to financing, but this was actually after our research uh, was written by Harvey Ko, where he said that, hey, Mainstream in investors are not able to understand that enterprises in the craft sector to distill operate in the cultural economy, that we are not building factories here. 
So because we are not building factories here and the artisan communities will have religious observances, they will not work for 15 days, or there will be you know, all kinds of things that an enterprise navigates. Are we saying that no artisan should be working nine to five? That is the best way to build a successful model? I don't think so. I think what the models that are emerging in our sector are in many ways telling us that there are multiple ways to build a model and navigate informality. And now it is also the job of the investors to innovate to say, how do we build better solutions for these craft enterprises? And somewhere, the enterprises and the investors have to meet each other halfway. And in some ways, this research is you know, a way to help people meet each other halfway, so that we both understand each other's language. And last but not the least, this was, uh, there are some team members missing here. The report was launched at Kula Conclave, which is uh, perhaps India's first uh, inclusive finance conclave for uh, creative, cultural, and craft-led enterprises. Uh, I'm really proud, as a closing thought, uh, to say that this was a research on finance led by a women-led team for a women-led sector. So uh, we finally cracked the language of finance. If you had met me three years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say any of this. But uh, I'm really grateful that it was this team and many others who, uh, you know, and few good men who actually contributed to the research and 50% of it actually was volunteer-led still. So uh, this is us and the research, two of our research projects and um, in the figures, it said that 24% don't know how to access finance, and that number seemed kind of low for uh, 65 not being able to access. So I was wondering why do enterprises think that they know how to access? Because that was kind of low, and I didn't understand why that could be. Uh, I, I would need to... Uh, the 24%? So a lot of it is also uh, framed around the questions that we ask them. So how they understand finance and funding. Uh, it's only when we were able to aggregate, if you went this way, this is that, if you, un do you understand debt, do you understand that? So that was the aggregation that led to the 24%. But 88% are self-financing, and depending on different questions we asked, the answers were also different, but essentially most people are struggling to uh, engage with investors, and depending on if you are a woman, then the struggle is higher. And even speaking the language of business and finance is tough for most people. But I think that 24% even... I go back to yeah, no, yeah. What she said is, uh, so uh, when you see the 88, the 90, those are nets that we've done. So that's kind of why you, you see that as a high number, which is reflective of the part that uh, the terrain seems unfriendly, by and large. Take the online yeah, question yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of the question is, uh, do the handicraft enterprises know and value informality? How to secure informality when the trends like getting bank accounts and paying taxes being traceable and transparent are becoming mandatory? Oof. Good one. I'm happy I'm not answering that question. Can we understand what is the split of enterprises requiring uh, these three different types of capital? I think you spoke about different types of capital, and uh, you could probably uh, also just reach out to this person later. It's, it's a very specific question. And the third one just came in. So this is, thank you for a great presentation. Is there a database or source to contact artisan clusters? I know you said that is not your primary focus, but enterprises, I'm curious on one excess. That's something we can take up later. Um, I am going to park one question, <laughs> which is, um, uh, one is a more clarification. Did the larger size of, or larger proportion of degenerative startups had anything to do with the methodology of how you actually had a shortlist that you must have administered the, um, you know, your survey to? The reason I ask is, uh, I would assume degenerative startups come at the latter end of the value chain. Uh, they're more closer to the consumer rather than the producer. And what guardrails do we need 
as this sector is on the precipice and sees this transformation from, let's say, interest capital influx of change in demand, that does not make the distance between the artisan and the final value procured for the products produced by them to get larger and larger, you know? So is, the, is it that there are more enterprises at the digenative end, or is it... Uh, Uh, so I had alluded to the fact that uh, the 45 percent, some of it uh, is likely to be uh, that it is online, they're online comfortable. Uh, there is also a burst of their, them because, you know, success begets success. People see that, okay, uh, these guys, I, I see these brands, they're advertising to me, that's the only way to go because I can't just sell to my to people in my pin code and their, their relatives. It has to be more than that. Um, so, uh, it is uh, something that is allowing people to, to go forth, uh, there is momentum there, uh, and therefore I don't think it's unreasonably uh, represented. I think the 45% is fair. What, I would say the other thing, like I wish we could have got more input innovators and all of that. There are fewer of them, uh, but I think that there would have been value, like if we spoke to three, I would have liked to speak to six. Uh, because I think their journeys and all of that are, uh, are good to know. The other thing that is also happening, which I mentioned, was if you saw the grassroots nurturers, uh, they have realized over time that that doesn't make sense anymore, that they need to, because you, have to, you can't just stay at the back end. If you want to have, because what the problem, the challenge they face is that you can, uh, you, you know, you invest in resources, you train people, but if you lose your market links, then that's it, you're left high and dry. So unless you build a brand and you can then project and say, okay, I know that this much I will be able to sell. Uh, it's not really a sustainable solution in today's market. So even people who would typically have been comfortable staying a, a, a grassroots nurturer, today find merit in becoming more of a digenative upstart. So we see that transition as well. I mean, this wasn't supposed to be a question answer thing, but that begets my question even more. And also brings me back to the point of what you started with, that this is a sector right now that's seeing demand outstrip supply. So if the back end where production is happening is also kind of facing a pressure from just a more pervasive plethora of enterprises that are coming at the end of the value chain, then this problem is much more acute being caused by an amplification of success that may not necessarily result if we look at it from a sectoral level. I'm not saying the enterprise itself is a problem, but I'm saying at a sectoral level, what is the balance we are going for? So, yeah, but you can also start with one. So, you know, so the last question that came, is there a database of artisans? We get that a lot, which is also in some sense, you know, um, suggest the interest that is emerging from every person who's coming, going to a design school, not just here, but like, Parsons, UK, so on and so forth. Everybody wants to save the artisan and support the artisan, which is great. Um, and they want to set up an enterprise. What most people are not realizing is that at this stage is where we need policy support. At this stage is where we need investment, not just in the enterprises, but investment in infrastructure for the, uh, for the entire sector. And when we say investment, in infrastructure, infrastructure could be, you know, public good data platforms. Like a 200 million artisans can't do research every year, no? Like this, this is not possible. Uh, but we need places where data gets aggregated, you know, and people are able to self-report. That is one piece. The second kind of infrastructure, and you know, like I will go back to the, uh, it's my favorite example. Like where did the IT sector begin? Why is the IT sector the, the way IT sector is? You know, the IITs begins, be, began somewhere, no? IITs didn't begin because you and I decided we need to set up an IIT. It's because the government decided an IIT needs to happen, right? Where is the IIT for the artisan? An aspirational school that my mother will say, Beta, tum bade ho ke IIT mein jaoge. Do we have that for the artisan? A Viva Service Center is not an IIT for the artisan. That is why we see a lot of the next generation not join, going in. So while there is support for cluster development and so on and so forth, I think we need to understand what is aspirational mobility and how do we deliver that for, to our communities because our communities also deserve better. And 
from a capital perspective, I would say that a lot of this kind of work can further be incentivized by capital. Because now there is a concept called impact-linked financing or outcome-linked financing, which means you can actually give money to an enterprise and say, I will actually, if I'm giving you money at 15% interest, if you are able to deliver an outcome, um, say you are able to do X, Y, Z in that 15% and you're, you return the money back to me in three years or one year, but if you return the money back to me, but you're also able to create gender inclusion for 500 women in the process, then I will reduce your interest rate from 15% to 9%. That is a legit approach these days. So why can't we incentivize more players to actually deliver outcome link and you know that kind of impact link financing for the sector? Because automatically enterprises then also are in many ways uh, become channels for social inclusion and social protections are needed. So to the question of you know what was the question? The first question uh, around social protection. So I I'm not trying to romanticize in informality here. There is that is not the uh, you know, uh, the sort of goal of this, you know, I'm saying that informality exists. We can see it as a bad thing. We, it is not necessarily, as we move along, every community and right down to our, uh, to the first mile communities, uh, to the women, to marginalized communities, uh, and to artisan producers and creative producers, there is nothing wrong in having a bank account. You know, it is nice to have insurance. I work in the gig economy almost, I feel. Though I run an enterprise, I feel like I, I don't know what my retirement is going to be like. However, those kind of social protections are needed. Medical insurance is needed. And those kind of benefits need to filter down. And that is a good thing. And what we are saying when we talk about the new formal is the ways of working in informality. That context informs business models. And therefore, you don't come with a preset agenda saying this is the only way we will run a business. The business then adapts to the challenges of the communities and navigates it, which is beautiful, I would think. Uh, but to say, and they, they also then bring in social protections in the process, which is also good for the communities in the longer run. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. more than that. And, um, is there any last question or? Uh, sure. One question, and then we'll close. Um, this is kind of a very pressing matter for me when we keep looking at technology, and we say that um, maybe we won't get an investor because you can't scale. I keep struggling because in the discourse, craft is posited as the form of technology. The semantics of technology include craft practice. And it's, it bothers me that most people don't or they won't accept craft as the original form of technology. And how, how do we change that? And I feel like... Thank you so much for the question, because I think one of the things that we've been really struggling with uh, is also discourse, language. How do we use language? So, in fact, just before we came, I was talking to Kinjala, and I was like, you know, for this sector, we first need to define what is technology. The next stage would be to define what is innovation. Because when we are talking about, you know, when we use words like this, we need to understand that sector within a cultural economy with the history that it has, has its own discourse just because it hasn't been mapped and hasn't been mainstreamed and hasn't, is not a case study in Harvard Business Review, does not negate their, you know, uh, the approaches that exist within the sector. So the first is to start questioning and actually asking the questions that you're asking, which we are also trying to do with the kind of research that we're trying to drive. To go to the basics and ask the question, saying, is this really what this means? Um, and the next stage is also then to talk to more people and start building collectives that can then push back. The reason why all of this, we are sharing this information is that we now need more people to talk like us and to ask the right questions. A reason why Kula exists is because now we need many more enterprises to talk the same language and ask and push back. So that's, I think, our way of doing it, but I'm sure you will find another way. Mm -hmm.
struggling in the field to um, get finance for things that are not um, in the interest of the present government, you know? I mean, there are a lot of people who came from Kanjiwaram, who came from these um, South Indian um, states, and they said that we're just not getting finance because we're not promoting the right kind of religion. And that's actually what Laila Kabir said to me, you know? She said, I mean, I'm, I'm not just not being allowed to finance even the kind of design I want on the saris, in the Mulkamul um, saris, for example, you know? So I'm, I'm just wondering whether you'll be able to overcome that and whether that is a limitation. I mean, it's a bit of a broad question, but uh, so many in the field, I mean, there were about 10 people on the panel that day, and every one of them was saying only fundamentally this, that our problem of finance is coming because we don't seem to be following um, ideologically the right kind of line. So, uh, you know, with businesses, she was talking about uh, the tendency that part of culture is that if business itself is ingrained, then you have an entrepreneurial mindset, you have a finance mindset, you have, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And we know that that's how it goes. One of the larger trends that we know is happening in India today, and uh, God bless millennials and Gen Z for that, is increasingly what we can see is that uh, it's almost American in a need to move away from power, from uh, previous power structures. So, uh, in fact, what does happen with a lot of the VCs and uh, uh, when you go to them is that they don't really care what your caste is, what your religion is. They want to know that you can pitch for the business and make that pitch. So, in fact, one of the things that uh, we try to do in this, uh, I'm, I'm going to just digress a little bit like, uh, like an attorney general. Uh, but uh, there is a story about uh, how Arjuna, when he finds Karna, was his brother. Uh, he cries in battle, uh, in the battlefield, that he killed his brother. And then Krishna mocks him, saying, do you think you could have killed a man so great? And then starting from Kunti, he lists the number of people who were responsible for his death. And then finally, he just, the final arrow is all he does. So it takes some eight, ten people. I forget the exact number, but that many people have killed Karna for Arjuna to finally be able to kill him. So with, when we were looking through the data, and I mean, we do, unfortunately don't have the time, but over two years, we would be like, oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, this is happening. So it is like each one of those things, it's like it's a wonder we even have the number of businesses and the amount of money that we have. So in fact, it is called financing a handmade revolution because we believe that that is actually possible. It doesn't even need, you don't have to pour like bucket loads of money. Uh, like uh, I am MSME registered. I don't take a rupee from the government because, I mean, like many white collar people, I fear it. Uh, so, uh, so, but the thing is that uh, I know how to build my white collar profile so that should I need financing, I can go there. There too, there is their own caste system because there is a preference for men. There is a preference if you're IIT, IIM or like, you know, credential business uh, administration. We have data for, uh, against all of that. So when you're not those things, it is probably, if you're somebody's wife, then it is a problem because then you're, you are only somebody's wife. So you have to, in fact, what we were hoping we could do through this, and if you actually spend time with it, is to build strategies and how to build your best case. There are other pools of money that are accessible, how to go after that. It's just that many people don't even know. And in finance, the names are often frightening. Yeah. That, uh, I mean, private may not be as frightening as government, yeah. but uh, they, uh, like navigating that space, and then somebody asks you two questions, you're like, thank you very much, bye. So uh, how to deal with that? Uh, so, I mean, that, that was my thought. Yeah. I mean, to very briefly answer your question, um, I feel with every government, there is, you know, the priorities change and so on and so forth. What we can tell you is that there is money. Yes. There is money. What we can also tell you is that uh, there are, like Nima said, different strategies. That is not the only pool of money available. There are now, what we are saying is that there are multiple pools of money available. We just have to look in the right place. So if you are serious about building an organization, a brand, or whatever that might be, what the best we can do for ourselves is to uh, make ourselves uh, literate when it comes to business and finance. That is something we owe to ourselves. And then figure out and find the right communities, the networks, and so on and so forth, to then find the kind of money that will work for you. Yeah. That is the best solution because in any, I mean, there's always going to be limitations when you're trying to run an organization. So there's no, 
we can't take a black and white argument when it comes to a sector. Um, no, but kind of, if I could have a response, I do think uh, some of the trends are more visible than others. Mm -hmm. Women not getting finance versus caste groups having unequal access to different platforms is something that if we haven't studied, we don't know and may exist, definitely does. Uh, as you said, culture has a say in how business is built and culture has a say in what product, what motive, what story you keep telling and if there is a top-down sort of, you know, a, a power that is stopping the stories that have actually built this sector, then there is a need to look at the exclusions that may come through the social demographics of this country, which are linked to the politics of you the know, country, I, to put that point. But I think I'm going to have to take a hard call as a chair, and we can continue this yeah, after yeah. the thing. Uh, Nima and Priya, really, thank you. More so because you made us sit in a room and uh, made us face the challenges of capital, something we often shirk away from. Uh, so I'm really glad that you made a capital front and center of this and told us how it operates, what are the challenges, and gave us a lot to think about. Um, and the one thing when we were curating this session, I remember having a conversation about is that I don't want a story of an enterprise, I don't want a story of wage, I don't want a story of a weave, I want a sectoral idea, and you, both of you just gave us a really good as good as possible a crash course in the time available. So thank you very much. We really appreciate the generosity. At IHS, the public's is an attempt to have conversations about uh, the most prescient con uh, and important uh, problems of our times. Uh, it is open to public and uh, we're really glad that we had a really good uh, audience today, uh, both online and offline. So thank you everyone for hearing this presentation patiently and also participating in it. Thank you.